Okay, now that we actually have our development uh, tools all installed on the system, we can try to build a kernel. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is actually go to uh, the Linux kernel archives. It's uh, www.kernel.org. And we'll see here that the latest stable kernel is 3.14.6. It allows us to download here from a link. Uh, down here, it just gives us all the options to download the kernel from. Um, in this case, we want to use the stable kernel. Uh, so, the, so the kernel tree that is actually marked as stable right now. And this is uh, 2014-607, so this was just released um, on Saturday. Uh, so click here, we want to actually get the, um, the tar.xz file. Um, if we right-click it, uh, we can actually view the um, copy link location. And we can't actually paste it into our VM, so we're going to have to type this all out. That's why we installed wget. Uh, so if we just right-click, open a new tab, um, cancel that out, we'll actually see the full address of that kernel line here. Uh, so we want to type that in over here using wget. So wget, https, www.kernel.org, forward slash pub, forward slash Linux, kernel v3.x, because we're using the 3 uh, series kernel, Linux 3.14.6.tar.xz. And we'll see the wget command just allows us to just kind of do a get download um, from the web uh, for that particular source. So it's going to take a few minutes, just going to download it here to our home directory um, in a compressed uh, file format, which is called a tar.xz, and we'll see how to actually extract that here in a few. Okay, it's done downloading now, so uh, let's actually move it to a place where we can start extracting it. Um, what we're going to want to do is go to user source, so cd user source. Um, and in the user source, we see a directory called kernels. Uh, if we ls that, we'll see that there's um, the kernel the system installed, uh, the binary of it. Uh, let's create a new one called custom kernels. And then cd into that. Now let's move um the Linux download we just downloaded here. But it's probably in home Ronnie. Yep, so MV home Ronnie Linux uh, to here. So now we'll see the uh, compressed files located in uh, user source custom kernels. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is use tar command uh, and give it the x for extract um, and the f command uh, to force. And then just Linux 3.14.6 tar.xz. Let that run for a few and it should compress it all into here, into a new directory. Okay, that's done. If we do ls, we'll see there's a new directory now called Linux-3.14.6, uh, which is that new kernel. And if we cd into that directory, we'll see all the sources. Um, so there's a readme file in here. It's always good when you actually download new source code that you're intending to compile to actually take a look at the readme. Uh, so let's bin that. What is Linux? Linux is a clone of the operating system Unix. So we go down through here. It's going to give you a little bit of history. Um, some information about Linux, and then documentation, and then installing the kernel source. Um, so here it's showing you, you can use gzip or bzip depending on what the actual extension. This is if it was a tar.gz. Uh, we had xz, so we used just tar xf. Um, but you see, I mean, they still all kind of just use tar and the x and f. V is just verbose, so you can see all the files as they're uh, decompressed and get a list. Uh, it tells you how to patch the kernel if you want to patch it. And here it's showing you how to actually get in and remove um, stale files uh, if you actually went and compiled the kernel and had a problem. Software requirements, so some dependency lists. Information on configuring and building if you want to get a little more custom that we're going to do here. Um, different options for actually configuring it. So we're going to use the make menu config, which gives us that ncurses based uh, menu to configure our kernel. 
uh, but there's other config options here as well. You can use xconfig if you're using x11 Windows, um, gconfig if you're using something like a GNOME-based window manager. Uh, so take a look, go down through the, uh, the readme file and uh, verify that you, you understand it um, before you go ahead and compile the kernel. So what I'm going to do now is uh, show you a little bit about make. Um, so if we type man make, this is a new program that was installed when we installed those development tools. Uh, we'll see there's a few options. So we can do make minus f to specify a make file, um, or we can just type make in a directory that has a generic make file that just goes ahead and calls all the functions. Um, we can give different options to make. Uh, one of the options you, you, you can give uh, make to have a perform in parallel is the, the minus j flag, which gives it a certain amount of jobs to run. So here we can see specifies the number of jobs uh, to run simultaneously. So if you have a multi-core processor, you can give this a minus J2, uh, and which would actually use two parallel jobs uh, to compile the kernel, which will give you a little more speed up on your time um, in, in compiling the kernel. Um, so a lot of different flags for make. Uh, take a look at this. One of the other options is usually when you, when you create a make file, um, there's usually a rule for clean, uh, which allows you to actually clean up all of the, uh, the stale objects and stuff that are in uh, the directory after you've uh, maybe had a failed build or maybe you build and you're trying to make some changes and you want to rebuild uh, so you clean out those object files so the, the source code doesn't get built again with, with stale objects. Um, so in this case we have a clean tree. There's no need to really run make clean but we can if we want to just to, to make sure. Make clean and it's just going to go ahead and clean things out. Okay, So we want to run make menu config. So what we want to do is configure our kernel first, and then we'll go ahead and build it. So if we run make menu config, it should bring us up a little ncurses base menu uh, that gives us all sorts of options of configuring our kernel. So here we go, uh, Linux 3.14.6 kernel configuration. We can see here there's a lot of uh, top level menu items um, that we can explore uh, for actually customizing our kernel. Um, so it's a 64-bit kernel. Uh, those of you running 32-bit operating systems, uh, that should probably just say 32-bit kernel. If we go into general setup, we can see um, a lot of stuff that typically doesn't need changing um, or tweaking if you're just building a normal kernel uh, for a regular server or desktop system. Uh, but you can kind of take a look at different options here, and if you want to get a little more information about an option, um, you can go ahead and just, uh, you got to use your arrow keys in here. There's no mouse interaction. Uh, go over here to help after you've highlighted an option, and then you can read all about that option um, within this help file. Okay, so basically we just kind of go through this menu by, by selecting items and then exiting back to the main tree um, and just going down through and, and just verifying we have set up what we want to set up. Now we'll see here that the kernel um, basically gives us a lot of interaction with the hardware, uh, the physical hardware of the machine. Um, so this is, this is kind of separating the user space and uh, the system's physical hardware. Um, and, and provides all the drivers and stuff necessary to actually interact with that hardware. Um, so here we see different partition types that we can support. Now this is a good thing about this. Right now the kernel supports quite a bit of everything. Um, we really don't need any of these partition types because we're not supporting any of these. We're just supporting basic Linux um, file systems on our system, partition types on our system, so we can go ahead and just get rid of that. It'll make our kernel smaller and perform a little bit better. Uh, so we can change our I.O. scheduler if we want. CFQ is usually the default. Processor type and features. This is going to allow us to actually get a little more information about our processor and fine tune it a little bit. Um, so this is if we actually want to do some hypervisor stuff with Linux guest support. Uh, so right now we just have a generic x86-64 uh, processor, which, you know, that's pretty generic. Um, but if we really wanted to specify, we could pick a Core 2 or newer Xeon or if you're running an Athlon uh, base processor, you could choose Athlon 64. In my case, I'm actually using a uh, Core 2, so I can go ahead and uh, select that option there. So now it changed to Core 2 newer Xeon. Um, this just gives us more uh, finer grained optimizations for our processor than just going with generic x86-64. It actually allows us to use some of, the, some of the features of our processor that wouldn't be available to, say, other processors like AMD processors um, if we're using Intel. Okay, so there's uh, multi-threading, so we can disable or enable hyper-threading if we wanted to. We can disable or enable multi-core support. Um, okay, this isn't a desktop. We're actually running a server, so we'll do no force preemption. 
Uh, okay, I'm not running AMD, so I'll uncheck that. But if you are running AMD, then you're going to want to do the reverse and uncheck Intel. Um, not a Dell laptop, so why do I need support for that? Again, I'm not using an AMD processor. And most of this other stuff you want to just leave enabled by default. As you can see, we're just kind of going through and we're, we're just reducing the footprint of this kernel. Um, 1000 uh, hertz timer frequency is good for a desktop system, but for a server system we want to bring it down to, to 1000 hertz. Okay, so let's go down to power management, ACPI. Don't really need our, our server suspending or hibernating, um, so we can get rid of the, the options for that. Power management, yeah, we do want power management options. Um, be able to do ACPI shutdowns, things like that. Simple firmware interface, not really necessary for us. CPU frequency scaling, um, so this would allow if you're running on a laptop where your processor actually can scale its processor to, to save power, uh, you would enable this, but we're using a server system, so we don't really need it. Um, okay, don't really need a governor, but that's a small one, we don't really care there. Memory power savings, Again, doesn't matter if you're using Intel, that's fine to leave that stuff. Okay, so here's our PCI options for our PCI drivers. So here's PCI Express support, um, standard PCI support. Don't really need PCM CIA cards because it isn't a laptop. Um, hot plugging options are probably good. Okay, this is all fine. So here's our networking support. So you can see we have uh, different options for networking for our kernel. So are we using Bluetooth devices? If we were, uh, here's a whole bunch of drivers that we can just build into our kernel uh, for different Bluetooths. But since we're not, let's take it right out of there. Uh, same with wireless. Do I need wireless? No, probably not. Don't need RF. Uh, don't need Plan 9 stuff. Um, don't need CAN. Wireless in general, we can remove that somewhere else. Um, totally get rid of it because right now if you see you see the star but it has these lines by it it means I can't actually change this option because other options are depending on it uh, but as soon as I get rid of those other options I can come in here and actually remove that uh, let's go into networking options here and we can see things like TCP IP networking multicasting advanced router um, so this is all support for these these uh, specific things IP tunneling uh, multicast routing IPv6, so if we want to actually remove IPv6 support, we can by, by changing this to nothing, but we'll leave that uh, built in because a lot of the firewall stuff nowadays wants it. Um, different protocols that we can be using over networking. ATM, don't really need ATM. Uh, Ethernet bridging, VLAN support. So you can see the kernel is basically, you know, encompassing everything here that the system actually needs to interact with the hardware, um, as well as the lower level devices. Batman Advanced Meshing Protocol. That's pretty neat. Open vSwitch. Don't really need support for that. Okay. So you can see the, the whole theme here is we're, we're just reducing our footprint again. Um, parallel port support. Don't have any of those on this. It's a virtual machine. Flock devices. So we don't have a floppy. We don't really need support for that. Don't have that array. We do want to loop back so we can mount ISOs. Uh, crypto, promise status support, don't really care about that. CD-ROMs, okay. So you get the general idea. I'm not going to go through every single option in this kernel, but I would like you guys to actually take some time and go through and start learning uh, the different sections of the kernel and go in and actually take a look at the help contents of certain items of the kernel. Um, figure out how to reduce your kernel footprint because the more you take out that you don't need like we're running um, we're running virtual machines here and they're using a subset of hardware um, some basic hardware so I mean we don't really need things like Pacific Digital we don't have any of that hardware on the system so if we take it out it's gonna it's gonna reduce the amount of time it takes to compile this kernel most likely this is the chipset that we're using is this ICH PIXX3 um, Intel based chipset so I'm fairly confident I can pretty much remove anything else on the system that isn't that. Um, and when we go to compile the kernel, we'll see it starts compiling every individual item uh, that we have actually marked as a module or uh, built in. 
and that's what that M is we're seeing here. The M is saying it's going to build it as a module, um, and the star indicates that it's going to build it within the kernel itself. So if it builds an, as a module, it's going to build a separate module uh, that gets run or started up uh, separately from the kernel itself. Okay, so once I'm done uh, configuring all my devices, let's just take a look at uh, some other sections here quick um, before we jump out of here. Hardware monitoring support for different sensors. Um, so again, you'd, you'd run something like sensors detect, uh, LM sensors to actually uh, figure out which hardware you have on your system, and then you could uh, compile in the hardware you want to compile. Okay, graphics support. So here's when we're talking about ATI cards, NVIDIA cards, Intel cards, um, the VIA cards. So here's all your graphic driver support in here. Graphic hardware support, sound card. Uh, so that's ALSA. It would be for sound, and we're not using sound on this system. Uh, but it's going to take a look at this anyway. And you can see here there's a huge list of, of sound card devices that are available uh, to be built as modules or into the kernel. Um, so again, go ahead and, and just rip everything out. Um, because we're not doing anything with sound, but if you were to use a sound card, you could go ahead and build the sound card you need in here and then remove everything else to reduce the footprint. Uh, so in this case, I'm just going to go out of here and just remove uh, sound altogether because we're not using it. Multimedia support, so am I using TV cards, radio cards, um, FM transceivers, all that stuff would be in here. Uh, no, I'm not, so I'm just going to get rid of it. Okay, then we can even see... Uh, Let's see if we get out of here. File systems. EXT2, EXT3 support, EXT4 support, XFS support. So you can see this stuff is, we did some of this uh, in the last modules last week uh, where we actually looked at file systems and we saw we actually compiled, or um, not compiled, uh, we formatted our file systems uh, after our, we did our LVM partitions. We did one as EXT3, one as EXT4, and then one as XFS. And you can see we need kernel support for those to actually use those file systems. Um, and mount them onto our, uh, into our actual root file system. So uh, these kernel options allow us to do that. Okay, so once you're done configuring your kernel, you just exit a few times until you get to this, and then you want to save it. So yes, I'll save my config. Um, and now we should have a file uh, called .config within this, uh, this directory. So we should be able to do ls um, .star. So this is going to be a hidden file. Uh, and we see here we have .config. So let's vim that. And we'll see here, this is just a text file that contains all of our kernel option settings. So we just used a handy menu tool uh, to configure this, um, but we could just edit this config file if we wanted to by hand. And you can see here, if it has a Y, that's the equivalent to a star in the menu config, meaning it's built into the kernel. Uh, let's go find us a module. We'll search. And there's a module right there. Config old profile equals M, so that's a module. There's a few other modules. Um, and then if it's not configured at all, it's just commented out like this is saying uh, config ACPI custom DST is not set. Uh, so that's showing us that it's, it's not configured in the kernel. It's just commented out. Uh, so you can use this to verify your kernel. Um, another thing is once you start building your own kernel, you can use uh, this, this .config file. You can uh, use a make old config. Um, to actually really quickly uh, incorporate your old changes into the new kernel and, and also actually differentiate and uh, mix the new differences from the new kernel um, into your config so that you can actually uh, build a new kernel quickly. Okay, so now we've configured our kernel. We, we've gutted out a lot of the stuff that we don't need. Uh, we've customized it down, so we want to actually build that new custom kernel. Um, in order to do that, we're going to use the make command again. Um, if we look at how many processors we have, we can do cat proc CPU info. And when you guys read the, the proc file system chapter and look at the links I've given you, you'll learn more about the proc file system. But in this case, we can just look at it to see our CPU information. And we see this, this virtual machine only has one processor allocated to it. If I allocated more, like two or three, I could actually do more jobs with make. Uh, but in this case, I only have one, uh, so I can do a make minus J1. Now, a typical rule of thumb is, is, is yeah, J1 would give me one job. Um, but sometimes you bump that up. So I could do a make minus J2 to give it two parallel jobs on one processor, but I don't want to go any more than that. So if I had four processors on the system, or four cores, I could do a minus J5 or minus J4 um, to make the processing go quicker. Uh, so we'll see what happens here if I start compiling. 
It's going to read that dot config file uh, and it starts setting things up. And then we'll see it starts compiling the kernel, each individual piece of the kernel. And you can see here there's an M, so it's compiling a kernel module there. Otherwise, it's actually just compiling um, an object file that's going to be built into the kernel. So it's going to take uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, it could take upwards of a half hour or so, depending on how big your kernel is, how much stuff you have built into it. Uh, so what we're going to do is let this thing run. Um, I'll shorten out the video a little bit, um, and I'll transition back into the end, and I'll, I'll go through the, uh, the finalization steps. Okay, now here we can see our kernel is finished compiling. Um, we're back to our, our prompt um, of our shell. We can see all the firmware was loaded, and if we kind of scroll up through, we can see um, modules here were finished up and compiled. Um, our buffer only goes so far. This is a pretty big comp compilation. I'm sure most of you guys this took probably anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to, 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 to actually compile. Um, but now what we should have is, a, is an image for our kernel uh, located in um, Arch x86 64 so if you're on a 64-bit kernel uh, yeah 64-bit machine it'll be x86 64 um, if you're on a 32-bit machine it'll just be x86 uh, so in my case I'm 64-bit um, boot and BZ image so that's the actual kernel image is the BZ image file um, so what I'd like you guys to do for a deliverable is give me a screenshot of the um, end of your compilation here as well as this ls um, arch x86 boot bz image to enter um, and just show me the, the symlink there that it creates. Actually, why don't you give me it with the um, minus ln flag uh, so I can actually see the symlink. So this is symlinking back to the x86 boot bz image in this case for the 64 bit. Okay, and we also see that, that v, um, and vm linux there um, as well as in the directory uh, of the source. We see a lot more files here that weren't there before. Um, so just take a quick look here. Uh, we actually compiled source code um, into a binary object that's going to be our kernel that we can boot to. Um, looking through here, we see all sorts of directories uh, that is part of the source code, like drivers, firmware, lib, kernel. Um, so all this stuff contains uh, C source code that allows us to actually build that, build that kernel from. Um, if we were to go in and actually take a look at one of the drivers um, that it builds, See, there's a whole bunch of drivers here. Let's just go into IDE. Um, and we can see here that there's C files. This is C source code. And there's header files with .h. Uh, so let's just vim IDE dma.c. Some random file. And we can actually view the source code um, for this particular uh, device driver. And if we needed to, we can actually change the source code and make changes to it and improve it or whatnot, and then recompile it and, and try it out um, just by booting through that new kernel. Uh, so this allows us to actually manipulate with the actual source code of the kernel, change it if we wanted to, and recompile. <coughs> a lot of power there for customization and, and bug fixing and all sorts of good stuff. Okay, so we've built our kernel. It's compiled. Um, now we can install it. Uh, so what we can do is a make modules install um, to install all those modules that were built when we built the kernel. So the things that weren't built into the kernel itself, that we didn't have a star um, or a Y in dot config. Uh, instead, we had an M. Those are modules. So we're going to have to install those because those aren't built into the kernel binary uh, to lib modules on the system. So the command make modules install does that for us. So we just do that. We'll see that after this is done, it should uh, put a directory with the kernel uh, version number in modules. So we can see it installing all these modules. This may take some time. Obviously, I built a kernel that was rather large. I didn't gut it as completely as I could have, so there's a lot of uh, modules here that are being um, installed that really aren't necessary. Uh, so a really good, tidy kernel um, will prevent this kind of bloat from occurring. So while this is going, I can talk a little bit more about the deliverables I expect out of this. Um, so again, I wanted you to take a screenshot of that end of the compilation. I also want you to take a screenshot of the menu config process. So when you actually do make menu config and you get the end curses output, I would like you to um, submit a screenshot 
of you actually doing something um, within that menu config process. Um, and then I want you to, to list some of the changes that you actually made to the kernel to customize it. Um, things that you may have removed from the kernel. Um, I'd like you guys to try to, you know, to, to gut quite a bit out of the kernel just to, to get the experience of actually um, going through the process and, and going through the help for, for individual items in the kernel, uh, looking at it, learning a little bit about each of the modules that you can build, um, and then cleaning up things that you really don't need in there, like InfiniBand drivers and things like that that uh, you'd never use on a virtual machine. Um, but, but the big thing we should, should look at here is we're not really going to actually install and use this kernel um, within this virtual machine. It was more of a process to, to get you guys used to actually compiling um, software from source. Uh, and it's a good idea to know how to actually compile the kernel because if you're actually using a distribution that isn't a binary distribution, um, like Gen2 uh, or Slackware or Linux from scratch, uh, you have to build your own kernel from scratch um, in order to upgrade your system. But in the CentOS world, uh, Ubuntu world, those kind of kind of Linux's um, distributions, you don't actually have to build your own kernel because whenever the update comes out, it's a binary release. Uh, it's a rather general kernel, and sometimes they have different packages for, for more customized kernels that you can use. Uh, generally, if we were to actually install this kernel to our CentOS system, I it's such a radical change because it's such a newer version of the kernel um, that it may actually call more, cause more issues than good. Um, so we're going we're gonna to refrain from actually going through and booting to this, but we, we just wanted to go through the process of learning how to actually do it and actually taking a look of what the kernel really consists of. Um, because that, that's really important that you actually see what the kernel consists of because it's, it's, it's a lot better than actually just reading um, a definition from a book. Um, in this case, you were actually able to see that the kernel consists of device drivers and actually look at specific device drivers that you may actually say, hey, I, I actually have that card. Wow, that's pretty neat, you know. Um, the other thing is it deals with scheduling and I.O. Um, and networking devices. We saw the whole list of networking options we could go through there uh, down to the protocol level. Um, is all built into that kernel. Uh, file systems for different support of different file systems and partitioning schemes. And then we saw that it deals with memory management and CPU settings as well. Um, optimizations. Uh, so these are all things you can get out of your kernel. Okay, so we see here it's still finishing up here. It's doing the depth mod. Um, it installed all the, the firmware to lib firmware and installed the modules. So now if we actually go to forward slash lib modules, uh, let's type uname minus r, which should give us our current running kernel version. And we can see it's 2.6.32 dash a bunch of stuff. Um, the kernel we just built was 3.14.6. So like I said, that's a pretty radical change. Uh, and CentOS likes to keep things on the older side, more stable side. So this is going to cause more harm than good to actually use this. Um, but we can see that we just did the make install, um, and in this directory we now have uh, 2.6.32 uh, modules. Uh, and when we did our, our yum update uh, before, we actually updated our kernel binary in that, and it also installed a new version of the kernel uh, modules to, to live module. And now we have our 3.14.6 uh, directory, which contains the modules for the 3.14.6 kernel. Um, so that's just all the make, uh, make modules install did. Let's go back into our custom kernels directory for a second here. Um, to actually install the kernel, uh, what we would do is we would just do a cp arch x86 64 boot bz image uh, to the boot directory. And now if we go to boot, uh, we're going to want to change that actually. It's not going to be bz image. We're going to change it to mv bz image uh, vm. 3.14.6 uh, x86 64. So that'll actually be the kernel, um, and we're going to want to change the permissions on that to, to match the other kernels. Uh, to make it executable. Uh, and there we go. So now what we could do is we could edit grub.conf. In this case, CentOS uses grub1. Uh, and we could actually sit there and make a line kind of similar to this where it says kernel. Um, and it's, this is the actual kernel line that's being called for grub to actually boot into that kernel. And then there's options here that are passed on to the kernel um, as it's being booted, like the actual root volume group that we're pointing to, uh, the language settings, the LVM volume group for swap. Um, just different options that we're passing through here to uh, boot our kernel to. 
Um, and you can see there's two, two kernel entries here because the kernel was originally this uh, 2.6.32.431.e16. Um, and then we updated this 431.17.1. Uh, so we have two options of kernels to boot to here. We actually boot our system if you hit escape or, or some other key when it's actually booting grub. Um, you can make a choice between the two kernels. Uh, so we can add, actually add a whole other line in here uh, that specifies our new kernel and then use that as a boot option. Okay, so that's it for today. We actually went through and we uh, compiled the kernel from scratch. We installed the dependencies and the, and the tools that we needed to do that. Um, so what I'd like you guys to do for homework is go ahead and compile a kernel on your own. Uh, like I said, go through and, and try to gut it out and make it uh, somewhat streamlined uh, for the VM. If you use the lspci command as root on your systems, um, actually we have to install PCI utils. to get that. So you install, ooh, I'm out of space. So it looks like that took up a little more space than I needed it to um, by actually installing that kernel. So I'm going to remove the module since I'm not going to actually um, boot to that kernel anyway. But let me do a yum install PCI utils and see if this works now. Okay, so there it is. So now if I do LSPCI, uh, we can see that it gives me a list of the uh, hardware devices that are actually installed on the system in terms of PCI devices. Uh, so what, what you can do is you can use this list um, to go ahead and go into your kernel when you're going through and, and gutting out the kernel. Um, you can look at these uh, these particular lines here and say, oh, it's a, it's a PIX uh, IIX3 chipset. And we saw when I actually went through the, the, the hard drive or SATA devices, that's the controller that I picked. Um, and then you can look here and we see the Ethernet controllers in Intel Corporation 82540EM. Uh, so in the Ethernet controller list within the kernel, uh, you can just basically deselect any um, controllers that are not this gigabit Ethernet controller um, and specifically pick this family of controllers for that device driver and, and uh, streamline your kernel that way. You can see there's no audio devices. Uh, we do have a USB controller, so we're going to want to build in USB support. Uh, and you can see here that there is a SATA controller, which is that um, ICH8M uh, SATA controller, so you're going to want to actually build in support for that too. That's if your particular system uh, displays these characteristics. Like if I do cat proc CPU info, I can find out what kind of CPU I'm running here, and I see it's an Intel Core i7. Uh, so when I was actually building in my CPU uh, stuff, I actually went to the um, the Core 2 or Xeon processor, which is specific to the Intel processor. Uh, if yours says AMD here, then you're going to want to choose AMD instead. Uh, so go ahead and make those customizations. Give me screenshots that, that show some of the major changes you made, um, and then give me some explanation as why you thought you should make those changes. Okay, so the other thing I want you guys to do is if you take a look at the class web page for the homework, um, we'll see what I have is uh, I have you going and downloading um, a command line uh, game. It's basically uh, kind of like a Dungeons and Dragons game that's actually played in the command line. Um, it's kind of a neat little, little, little lesson to learn. Okay, so your users have requested that you install NetHack on the CentOS 1 server. You must install it from source in order to build all the features they are requesting. Because you could probably install it from, uh, from Yum, uh, but that's not any fun. That's not, you're not going to learn anything by doing that. So um, obtain the source code for the game here. Uh, so if you click the NetHack site, you'll, you'll get a little description about what it is um, and all the reviews on it and all that good stuff. All-time 100 video games and Time Magazine. Um, so it's just a text-based role-playing game, basically. Uh, but it allows us to compile it from source uh, on our minimal CentOS system, so it should be fun. We already have all the dependencies necessary to, to compile this from source by installing the development tools and NCurses packages. Uh, the extra stuff we installed for the kernel wasn't necessary for NetHack, um, so you can do this either before or after your kernel, but I suggest you do your kernel, kernel compile first to get a practice. Uh, you're going to have to read the README. You're going to have to download um, the NetHack source code, which you get from here. Uh, click this first button to get the source.tar.gz uh, file. Uh, so you ensure you get that source code. Uh, this is an RPM to get the binary, which we don't want. Um, so make sure you go for the source code. 
Okay. So once you get the source code, make sure you extract that and then go through it. Read the README file. In there, it tells you how specifically to compile under Linux. The README file points to another file that tells you how to specifically compile under Linux. So make sure you read that stuff carefully. Um, and then there's another reference here that you can look at uh, that kind of gives you a little idea of how to compile. Um, you're going to want to look at the on Linux uh, section of that. Uh, and then go ahead and there's some deliverable options down here for, for what you need to put in your write-up um, and specifically what I'm looking for. So that's the, uh, the source code compiling um, exercise that I want you guys to do on your own. And I've already shown you guys how to do the kernel, but I just want you to kind of gut through that a little bit more detail um, than what I, what I showed. Okay, so the next module is going to deal with networking and show us how to actually set up static IP addressing on our systems.